Today is uh, brainstorming on the idea of activation and strategies to engage people to create actions for the SDGs. Uh, there is uh, a two presentations that are coming for the first part, which is uh, going to be presented by Deidre, uh, which is the methods of uh, engagement within ECMOS, particularly to explore the ADCOM perspective. The other one is an alternative approach to stakeholder engagement, which uh, Cecily will be um, sharing with us. And this will be uh, a discussion around uh, 15, 20 minutes each, and we will have a, um, a discussion afterwards. And uh, as you know, uh, from the January meeting, we'll have an NC and ISC sharing today. Uh, Ecomos Bolivia, uh, Fabiana will be joining us, and then our colleagues from ICLAS, he will be uh, uh, sharing, Mary. so uh, it will be just two presentations. Yeah. And I think that's about it. So um, I'll end here and then we can listen in to uh, Deidre's presentation on methods of engagement within ECMOS. It's probably just more of a, if you're not familiar with how people engage, uh, Deidre will provide us some information. Deidre? So I am... Um... Gabe asked me to, I don't know how it happened, but you know, we were chatting and um, I ended up with this job of just explaining a little bit about how uh, engaging with the advisory committee or um, that's the title I've put down. Um, so forgive me if some, for some people, this is absolutely what you already know, but I think for a lot of people, they don't understand how um, messages get through uh, you know, how ICOMAS actually works. So hopefully this will shed a few light, um, lights or actually um, provoke questions. So um, I have a very uh, inadequate diagram of, because I suddenly discovered it was much harder than I thought to make diagrams. So what I haven't done is I haven't done um, connections and etc. But just to say you've got ICOMAS, the board sitting at the top with Teresa Patrizio as our president. Um, as you know, as the bureau, and with the vice presidents of all the um, regions, um, part of that bureau and the treasurer, and ICOMAS board is served by the secretariat. So the board actually makes the decision and spends the money effectively within ICOMAS. The advisory committee then sits there advising the board and generate, you know, they, we, we produce resolutions that actually have to be ratified by the board in order to be expedited through the organization. And underneath the advisory or, or comprising, I should say, the advisory committee are the ISCs, the, basically the scientific council, the national committee council and the working groups. So, um, and then of course, underneath that, there's all the, all, you know, under the ISCs, uh, under, the, yeah. So there are ISCs that I told you was a bad diagram. Anyway, I'll go to the next one. So, because I've got another better diagram later on. Um, so I just did a little snapshot of what's on the website, the ICOMAS.org website. And I looked at the governance underneath on the left hand. Um, there is the advisory, the board, the general assembly, which is all the membership, the advisory committee, the scientific council. And what was missing is the national committee council. So I've added in a few things in red. Um, the members and committees, there's national committees, there's all the scientific committees, but there's also working groups on a par with those. And then under that, there's regional groups. So, and the only one that was down on the website was Europe. Well, of course, there's Africa, the Americas, Arab, Asia, Asia Pacific. So I've just added in red there a little bit. You know, there are a few things that need to be updated on this to... Um, to really bring us into the 21st century. So engaging with ADCOM, um, the, the, as I said, the advisory committee is composed of the presidents. And actually this is a definition that is up on the website. It's composed of the presidents of national and international scientific committees. So I have added in again in red and the focal points of working groups. Its function is to advise the board and to make suggestions and recommendations on the priorities and direction of the program, um, including, and the, the red, again, 
I've put in, including ensuring two-way communication between national committees, scientific committees and the working groups. Um, it used to be relaying information between them, but actually what is crucial is this two-way communication. We're not just telling people, we're actually seeking the inputs of all, all all of the, the workhorse, if you like, of all the members of all the committees within ICOMUS. So this advisory function is facilitated by communication. Um, so if I take a minute to say what form of communication does this take within the advisory committee? Well, of course, there's the annual meetings. Um, the, and then what has become very important is the annual reporting. It used to be a bit formulaic, but actually we've now started taking the, um, the annual reporting as the way of finding out what is important to the other committees, the scientific committees, the national committees, etc. And for the last um, four years, the, there have been um, uh, annual report, the national committees have, have prepared um, uh, sort of templates, if you like, added questions to the annual reporting to make sure that we could draw down from them what is important to, um, to uh, what, what's important to those committees so that they inform the agendas of the, of the uh, yeah, I've probably jumped ahead, but, you know, I'll come back to how those agendas are actually um, created for the annual meetings in a minute. I'll just carry on and say the communications are annual meetings, annual reporting, the ADCOM circulars that the Secretariat issue on behalf of um, the organisation to the uh, presidents, um, to the listservs basically. Um, there is a listserv for the for ADCOM, there's a listserv for the NATCOM and there's a listserv for the Scientific Council. There's also listservs for the working groups as well, or at least for the SDG working group. Um, but we are now proposing that they be called posts, because what we want to try and do is to highlight the fact it's become in COVID over the last um, year, everything has reverted to email. And the, the, the kind of the hierarchy of communications has somehow got a little bit lost. So ADCOM circulars always required a response, but it hasn't, you know, they're not getting, they're getting issued as uh, ADCOM info as a kind of a more uh, attractive format but I think the the message has has to be remade that actually a response is required and so we were proposing that they be called posts but the jury's out here on that so as well as these kind of crucial um, must respond to posts or circulars you've then got the ICOMUS info for you know sort of a, a newsletter which can contain should contain all of the individual calls for the various seminars etc in order to avoid having endless emails on a daily basis which I'm sure everybody is is a little bit challenged by um, and then a last sort of communication function is probably um, the work around the development of doctrinal text charters guidelines. So it's the kind of the scientific content. Um, I'm sure some of the um, of my colleagues who I've seen on in, in attending will say, "Oh, you've forgotten this." So please feel free to come in at the end and and, and highlight that. But anyway, I'll keep going um, until 2014. ADCOM comprised a president and two VPs, and that was it. And basically, um, there was, of course, there was a scientific council and has been a scientific council driving the scientific work of ADCOM for some time. But the, the actual ADCOM agenda was created by a call to uh, committees to say, anybody have content to put onto the thing? And then obviously in the absence of any content, which was unfortunately became the case um, more recently, um, then it was generated um, by, by the president or the VPs or whatever. Um, 
So in 2014, a working group in Florence was established to consider how to reorganize and drive the work of ADCOM um, to disseminate output and to capture the energy of all the committees. So this report, this working group reported to the board in March 2015. And then in 2015, later in, in the autumn, in, in Fukuoka, ADCOM was restructured. And for the first time, a national committee council, uh, well, a national committee was created as the counterpoint to the scientific council. Um, but really, um, I've put in council in there because it became called NATCOM, but really uh, sort of as part of ADCOM, but really it needs to be the national committee council. And that's why it's in red. So we're, we're, we're talking about renaming it this year. Three NCOs were elected as, so national committee officers were represent, were elected as representatives of the NCC. And they formed a counterpart to the three also elected scientific council officers. And all six officers elected then worked as a bureau for, a, a, an, a, as ACOs for a bureau for ADCOM. So, just to say the annual meeting of NAPCOM is now organized and this is only four years old or five years old this year um, since 2015. Um, it's now organized under the direction of the three NCOs as a counterpart to the already long established scientific council and this meeting provides a unique opportunity um, for dialogue and discussion because as most of you will will acknowledge um, the other meetings the agendas are really very tight very often they it's it, it allows very little presentation it there's a lot of content for noting for voting etc so this is all an, an opera you know a work in trying to sort of make trying to make sure that there's no repetition in the meetings and trying to make sure that we do provide an opportunity for dialogue that really picks up on what is important to the to the committees out there. And the other thing to say just here is that regional groups were identified as a very important missing link. <clears throat> so this is just um, from a snapshot from the website what the, the advisory committee is. You'll see in blue up there the this is the function that they were there for relaying to national committees and ISCs but so I did a diagram of what this really is. So you've got ADCOM sitting there, which really comprises um, the National Committee Council and the Scientific Council. And these are your three elected NCC of NCOs and on the other hand, the Scientific Council officers. So in large, the SCOs are Mikael Lander, the president, Sheridan Burke, hi Sharia there, I know, Krister Gustavsson from Sweden, Doug Comer, myself, and Kian Boone as the three NCOs. So the board is sitting at the top. ADCOM really should be um, a bubble that surrounds all of those other um, uh, dots. But my um, ability to work this, um, <laughs> the diagram sort of failed me in the end and I decided to just tell you that instead. Um, You've got under the NATCOM, the national committees, there are 110 of them. There are working groups, there are four, I think, that are, are um, transversal working groups. And this is very important distinction. The SDGs is a transversal working group. It has members from both the national committees and the scientific committees. Whereas there are another couple of working groups like the indigenous um, heritage um, working group, which is actually going to become a sign, an ISC in due course. Um, so just to say that's a distinction. And then there are the 28 scientific committees on the last count, I believe. Um, what we do, um, this is, you know, this is really the work of ICOMAS overall and not just of ADCOM, but there is one thing down there, the scientific exchanges, uh, the International Scientific Symposium, and that has been something that just hasn't happened, so I'll just note that there. Um, and underneath is the advisory committee function yet again. So the annual meeting 
Um, and this sort of is comprised of um, the ADCOM meeting, the NATCOM Council meeting, the Scientific Council meeting, the regional group meetings, the EP working group meeting, and under that, and at the same time, typically there always were as many ISC um, working group meetings as could take place that could be facilitated. But in 2020, as we all know, we moved into a virtual format. Um, and so the, the ACOs actually had to organize um, meetings that actually could facilitate the different time zones. And it's, I believe me, it's nearly impossible. In fact, it is impossible to, to make it nice and comfortable, but, um, you know, and to get everybody um, to, to facilitate everybody, somebody is always going to be getting up at four in the morning or staying up until until um, 12 or one o'clock at night. Um, and so we, we split the meetings into each meeting had two meetings to try and make them shorter and to try and make the the horrible time slightly less horrible for people. We could not have all day meetings or half day meetings anymore. Um, so that's why that happened over as you as you probably are all well aware. Now coming back I said to the agendas they are generated by reviewing the annual reports that all the committees need are required to submit in order to be compliant within their membership of ICOMAS. And as I said, the NCC, which because it was new, it didn't have a whole lot of, of, of statutory business it had to actually uh, uh, do. It provided room for discussion. So over the first triennium of the NAT, National Committee Council, we did a review of the um, compliance of committees and we actually we added in questions to the reports seeking um, information and as the SDG group will know uh, because there were questions added in relating to the SDGs um, which which gave us information which provided also uh, information for the report that was done by the ICOMAS intern, um, the, by the SDG intern, uh, Alicia, I think. Um, sorry, I, I just forget the name. Um, Gabe, you could cut in and, and, and tell us. Anasha, Anasha is the name. Anasha, of the... yeah, thank you. Um, and then you've got, so the, yeah, and so, that's your agenda, um, but as well as that, the National um, Committee Council provides a mouthpiece for the regional groups to, to actually inform everybody about their activities so that they don't just talk to themselves. They actually also um, report through um, the National Community Council to um, sorry, National Committee Council to um, ADCOM and the ISCs report to ADCOM through the Scientific Council and the working groups report direct to ADCOM. So there should be, and there always was in the past, a kind of a standing slot on the ADCOM agenda for the working groups, the transversal working groups to speak, to report. Um, so just the one thing I want to say about this is the red at the bottom. The ACOs are actually working as a bureau driving the work of ADCOM. And I've, the next three slides are, are a sort of a quick snapshot of the sort of thing that we're doing um, as ACOs. Um, some of them will be tasks that the SCOs will lead on and some will be the NCOs leading. Um, the Triennial Scientific Plan, and we all know we've had several presentations about that. There is the um, review of the Gergion uh, principles, which are actually um, with specific reference to working groups, um, supporting the SDGW working group, supporting the Climate Change Heritage Working Group, supporting the Indigenous Heritage Working Group and its establishment. So, you know, there's work around those things. There's, as I said, identifying common and emerging themes for scientific collaboration um, amongst 
all of the committees, not just the national, the national committees, um, organizing joint seminars, capacity building, research, raising awareness, you know, you name it. There's a lot of work that actually goes on behind the scenes. There's, Assisting and holding the scientific symposium I've put in red because this is an aspiration that we might reach on this year. We, we didn't have a scientific symposium last year and it's actually, it has been um, it, central to our work over a long time. So we're hoping that that can actually um, be brought back. Um, supporting the development of um, a framework for the the emerging growth of national scientific committees, um, analysing ICOMIS's role in heritage advocacy, assisting the ACOs in the inaugural, um, now inaugural, in actual fact, the NATCOM has been doing this, as I said, for the last, since 2015. Um, but the ISCs have been reviewing ISC health over the last three years and reported um, last year and the working groups will also be looked at in the same way um, in, in, but in a benign sort of format and structure. So just to say this is all ongoing. Now one of the um, tasks, one of the principal tasks that um, ACOs have been working on is assisting in the development of um, terms of reference and a work program for a task force on communications and sustainability. And this includes um, sustainable mode of operandus for our organization and indeed succession, uh, communications and institutional memory. So there's the, this is ongoing. This was work that was uh, uh, created in 2019 on the recommendation of ADCOM. A, a resolution was passed at ADCOM 2019 and terms of reference were set up and presented to the board, I think in March um, of 2020, but we all know what happened in March of 2020. We were overtaken by COVID. Ironically, a lot of the, um, the work that um, we would be doing, are doing, etc., is and was written down in that um, terms of reference. So there's a lot of, of kind of tweaking that we maybe can improve, but you know, there are a couple of major things and one of them is the institutional memory that is ongoing, um, not least because of the imminent departure of, um, you know, people um, moving on and the need to make sure that there is a, 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 a record and a, a structure for filing that actually um, works at every level of the organisation. So there are some very important key aspects as well as all of the other, um, you know, things that maybe the one thing I think is really important to say is that vast amounts of work are already being done. So the fact that there's a task force is not actually in any way dissing their effort, but it's just to say that perhaps there are there are improvements that can be made. There's certainly this, um, you know, the idea of moving um, to a more uh, virtual format um, and to stay with at least hybrid options in the future does require a really concerted effort and it so that was why that that is why that task force is being established um gabe what what's the time like for me uh it's coming to nine um uh, 20 minutes now so um 20 minutes okay yeah. well let me just not go on let me just whiz through this you can read this because i'm sure you can have the presentation if you want it but you know that the the agendas uh, supporting communications, developing a mentoring program, etc., is all work that we've been doing. So in 2020, ADCOM resolved to widen the group of ACOs by seeking volunteers to help um, in this work, um, to co-op them basically, um, to support the ACO's role. It'll have three key things. It'll allow an increasing number of people to share experience and help to disseminate the role of ADCOM and the work of the ACOs. Secondly, it'll help to increase the pool of future candidates standing for election. And I would just say that 
2021 is actually the next adcom election so there will be more elections um in 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 october of this year for adcom officers and then uh, thirdly it'll, it'll greatly increase the efficiency of the work done by the acos and i want to just finish with this um this last thing which is that um sorry now i just want to give myself yeah, turn off the bar that came up on the right. Yeah, so I'm just showing you the call that is, and, and the date is clearly wrong. It's it's ad compost, and it was supposed to be number two, and it was supposed to be issued in January, but I think that it hasn't quite uh, made the um, airwaves yet. But basically, it is an appeal to all of ICOMAS, all the committees, national, scientific and the working groups. It's called Securing the Next ICOMAS Generation, Transitioning the Future of the Advisory Committee. And it's, it, it is seeking, it's an expression of interest to identify ICOMAS members, including EPs, to volunteer to support the coordination of the work and projects of the Advisory Committee resolutions and mentor the next generation of ACOs. Um, so basically, I suppose, we're seeking an expression of interest from members to support this work in 2021. And um, I think that that is actually, you've seen the kind of work that was is being done um, already, and this is the call. So maybe watch this space. We will certainly be looking for, um, for people to uh, collaborate in both this and maybe even the, you know, for the SDGs in particular, the um, so the task force on um, sustainability and communications task force might be an obvious um, fit. Okay, that's me. Thanks. And I'm sorry for running over time to you all. Um, thank you very much for that, Deidre. I think it's, it's quite uh, obvious that um, the work of the uh, SDGs working group is quite um, um, tied back with the ACOs. And uh, thank you for sharing that, uh, you, that the, the ACO supports the work of the SDGs working group. We have a couple of questions for later, but uh, maybe um, uh, we will reserve that and let Cecily present her ideas first of um, an alternative type of um, uh, engagement um, that Deidre has provided how we uh, present or uh, deal with their work now in ECOMOS, but maybe there are other um, strategies out there. So Cecily, um, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I will share my screen. Um, I don't need the camera. Okay, everyone can see my presentation. The first slide. Yes, we can see it, yeah. yeah. Yes, okay. Yes. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, in my presentation, I will talk about time banking as an alternative approach to stakeholder engagement. And I've structured my presentation into three parts. Uh, first, I will um, uh, share how I developed an interest in time banking and how I see it relating to my own practice and engagement. Second, uh, I will share an emerging initiative to develop a time bank within the context of the World Heritage Convention. And finally, I will speak about time banking as an alternative uh, approach to stakeholder engagement and possibly uh, with relevance to ECOMOS. Okay, how do I go to the next? Uh, I am an economist by training and through my 20 years career, my work has focused on the support of local communities and their sustainable development. And since 2008, I have specifically supported implementation of the World Heritage Convention and UNESCO World Heritage Sustainable Tourism Program. And through the World Heritage Center, I've had the opportunity to support World Heritage Site Management Authorities in the development of sustainable tourism strategies. However, over these years, uh, my life has changed. I've become a mother and climate change has given me a new outlook on future, on my role and my contributions. And observations and experiences has led to an increasing cognitive dissonance towards personal practice and priorities. So let me share some of the causes of this dissonance. First, it relates to me as an expert, engaging in a top-down approach set out through the system and organizations I'm part of. 
Second, it relates to the high cost of knowledge to those in need of assistance. And despite the competitive environment among experts and uh, advisors, assistance offered is not necessarily the most appropriate. It relates to the ad hoc efforts of community involvement, which usually don't lead to any form of future participation, economic redistribution or benefit. It also relates to the acknowledgement that I, as an international expert advisor, will never be an expert on the complex challenges with the communities I hope to serve. And from a personal perspective, and now being a mother looking into the future, the climate change predicament limits to growth, the carbon footprint of the tourism sector and my own practice had led me to halt where I'm seeking a more uh, carbon friendly practice. Also with a young daughter and elderly mother, I need to carefully prioritize my time. And as an independent consultant, this is also the challenge of us, um, accessing necessary support when my computer crashes or when the shores can no longer be ignored. Oops. So three years ago, I rented an office space in the co-working hub. I was uh, in the process of developing a new website and I needed technical help. I was looking around me and I saw people with relevant skills that I could have helped me out. However, I was afraid to tap their shoulders and ask for help. I knew they were busy and I believed I probably couldn't offer them anything of relevance in return. This led me to Google whether there existed an app that could be used by members of the hub to connect and exchange skills and resources. And this was my introduction to time banking, a new old way uh, to connect, collaborate and make better use of available resources residing within the community or network. And time banking is based on the acknowledgement that all people have something valuable uh, to contribute. And enabled by new technology, time banking is now a global movement, both online, uh, of both online and uh, local networks. And learning about, um, yeah, well, at the same time, I discovered a whole new set of ideas and work around the value, which opened my eyes to the commons accompanying, often um, empowered through complementary uh, and people-powered uh, money, such as time credits, as a way of uh, stewardship and shared, uh, of shared resources, and as a regenerative alternative to the destructive economic growth paradigm. And this led me to sign up for a PhD at the University of Cambria, where I'm now doing an action research on how I, as a heritage um, and tourism professional, can apply a commons orientation to improve practice. So supported through action, this action research, I'm currently setting up World Heritage Catalysis as an online commons oriented community of practice and co-production platform. It is basically an entry point for the various stakeholders that would be involved in developing a World Heritage Visitor Strategy. But it goes beyond suggesting that complex challenges can be solved through strategy development and policy implementation. Instead, it invites uh, ongoing multi-stakeholder collaboration with the aim to support a community of practice, enhancing resilience, adaptive and transformative uh, capacities. And, uh, designed as a membership platform, it uh, does not only avail relevant resources, but furthermore offers a platform for World Heritage stakeholders to share, sell, request, co-produce and crowdsource competences, courses and resources currently not available within budgets. So on the left, this is an idea to, um, uh, on how the resources, uh, which currently mirrors the UNESCO World Heritage uh, Sustainable um, uh, Tourism and Visitor Management Assessment Tool, which will be uh, made available in the hub store as a pick and choose on the platform. In the future, it will offer resources from a variety of people with different skills and knowledge to share. And hopefully several of you will be interested to use the platform to market, avail and sell your expertise in a cost efficient and carbon friendly way. Integral to the model is VETS, the World Heritage Exchange Trading System, a time bank with a time-based credit developed in the context of the World Heritage Convention and in support of World Heritage sites and associated communities. Uh, founded on time banking principles um, that everyone has something to offer, 
it uh, seeks to realize assets that otherwise would remain dormant in people, communities and organizations. So BITS is um, based on the currency that we all have, time. It's, it's very simple. It's working on the principle that one hour equals one time credit that circulates between individuals and organizations that are willing to accept it. And through um, VETS, all members are valued and rewarded for their time, talent, skills, interactions, and contributions. For individuals, it will be free to register a VETS account. Um, a monthly renewal will, however, cost six time credits earned from contributing to community. Uh, through World Heritage Catalysis, there will also be other plans, um, including additional benefits and opportunities. And as you register, you identify your skills and what you're willing to share against payments in time credits. You must also indicate some needs and interests for which you're willing to pay time credits. One should not only consider needs and offers from a professional perspective, but equally important, indicate non-professional skills and needs. As one hour equals one time credit, whether you have a PhD or are unemployed, Matching needs and offers in a large and diverse network will allow more to do what they're good at and enjoy. Time-based credits can be earned and spent in the VETS marketplace. Exchanges can be one-to-one, uh, one-to-many, to many-to-one many to one or many-to-many. Many. This gives you an idea of the front end developed in Cyclus, and, uh, which is a work in progress. To the right, you see the effort to set up categories for exchanges in support of world heritage. Besides VETS Marketplace, uh, you will also be able to use time credits to pay to its resources in the hub and offers negotiated with the external partners. So this is to illustrate the uh, effort to go from clustered and disconnected uh, stakeholders towards a collaborative and inclusive global community of practice. In the next part of my presentation, I will focus on how time banking and, and vets could be considered as an alternative or complementary approach to stakeholder engagement uh, in e-commerce and among its members. So first of all, I would like to emphasize that time banking is not a mechanism for rewarding all forms of volunteer work. E-commerce should remain a volunteer organization where people share uh, their skills and time without expected to be compensated for it. It's neither an opportunity to claim compensation for time spent on uh, efforts without meeting an already articulated need. But time banking could be a mechanism to reward sharing of resources that otherwise would remain dormant among its member and within the organization. It could be used to attract and keep people otherwise unable to participate and volunteer and bring rights-based approach into practice. So let's start with uh, what, how it could potentially be relevant for heritage professionals and you. Uh, so for World Heritage or for Heritage professionals, including e-commerce members, vets could be used to identify and connect with people beyond existing networks. Time credits could be earned by offering skills, knowledge, experience, and available resources and spent towards what is offered in, uh, in the network, partners as well as um, to source what you need. Or even you could uh, find experience, pay for it experiences in your local community or uh, at your next travel. And personally, I would like to make use of that to uh, get the uh, technical assistance, uh, proofreading, uh, translation, and things that I need uh, for my work. I would also, I'm actually also planning to use it uh, um, to, to, yeah, reward people that contribute into my PhD research. So hopefully vets could make life and work more fun and free up time to do more of what, what you love. As for e-commerce, it could suggest vets to encourage learning and exchanges among members, as well as co-production between committees and working groups. With an organizational vets account, e-commerce could, through bundles of time credits, realize special projects that otherwise would have required payment in conventional money. It could encourage and reward key functionalities, such as focal points and mentors and mentees, 
And, and as an organization, it uh, should also identify, um, it could also identify opportunities to spend time credits such as to its membership fees. Um, it could also, for instance, allow people with less economic means um, a way to pay for membership. And finally, vets could be used to negotiate new partnership on the demonstration of the impact uh, where support to its time credit, uh, which would cost uh, the fraction of estimated value of volunteer hours, could continue to circulate and benefit community much, much longer than conventional money, which immediately escaped the circuit. So this is just a quote um, around lifelong learning. So in the new holistic, all-embracing world of the 21st century, every organization, every individual becomes a depositor into and a withdrawer from the bank of knowledge, which com comprises the learning society, which is uh, where, the, where the next paradigm lies. So with that, I would say that we have what we need if we use what we want. That's a quote from Edgar Kahn, who is the founder of modern time banking. And I would like to emphasize that this is a work of progress. And this is something I, I really would like to invite those of you that are interested to come and join in and explore and be part of. Um, yeah, that would be very exciting. So please get in, in touch uh, afterwards if this is of interest to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Cecily. I think uh, that's a very interesting project and very um, thought provoking that uh, the type of uh, work that is uh, what we do in Ecomos can also be traded in a, in a different way that uh, will also benefit our needs. Um, this, this conversation started off, um, I think a couple of months ago in November or de December, we had this conversation on what is the value of our volunteer work. And that was a part of a meeting that we had um, and uh, you know, uh, thinking about our own times, our own expertise, our own traditional work outside of the outside of Ecomos, and that this is the reason why I, I thought that um, this uh, thoughts from Cecily will be good. So I now open the floor for uh, uh, both presentations, uh, questions for both presentations. We had some some comments, and um, uh, if you're interested, you can you can uh, uh, open your videos as well, and we can have like a, a, a fifteen or twenty minutes um, uh, uh, Q and A. Um, um, Ege had a question on uh, with Deidre's uh, presentation with regards to the of official processes um, of uh, adoption and amendments. Um, Ege, do you want to uh, ask further your question? Um, thank you, Gabe. Hello, everyone. Um, Mine is a small um, kind of technical thing about the red font, the, the text that uh, Dirju was talking about being added. Um, I was just wondering um, about the status of that. So th there's an amendment um, going on, um, but I, I missed that part, or maybe you didn't say it, I'm not sure. Um, so okay. how's can I can I cut in there, Gabe, and, and, and say... Um, yes, please, yeah. In a way, you know, there was red text on a variety of things. For instance, there was a website, um, you know, the ICOMAS website, and I took a snapshot of that and put it onto the screen. And I had actually inserted red text onto that. Well, you know, I'm not saying that, that um, the ACOs are updating the website. We don't have that capacity. And I would say it's not necessarily a priority within the secretariat at the moment either. There are resources. And what we have to do is remember, you know, the, the, the scarce resources and the juggling. But what I, what I wanted to stress to, to you, I was using the, um, the website uh, as a kind of a shortcut, but then I realized it, it wasn't actually up to date. And it, it, that's exactly the sort of uh, small information that we're, you know, that the Sustainability and Communications Task Force is, is doing all the time, is that we're finding some things don't work terribly well, or, you know, you know there's, a, there's an unintended consequence, and we're trying to remedy those things. So, um, the, the, when most of the, for instance, the, the name, the, the community, the NATCOM Council, um, I think we're able to do that within the NAT ADCOM ourselves. It's not something that requires a lot of money being spent. But, you know, even, 
calling uh, adcom posts posts as opposed to circulars we don't send them all out through the less listservs so we we collaborate and we have to get them noted to the board so it is a process of agreeing changes and i think that's an important thing when 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 the secretariat or our doing work on our behalf they they will only do it once it's approved by the board because that's the chain of command if you like so sometimes that's quite tantalizing because you see something that needs to be done but you actually you know the, the cogs of an organization move slowly but what we are trying to do as that task force this is say sctf is to identify you know to, to structure the amendments that, and the tweaks and the improvements that we need to do to make an existing system which has been forced to transition into into um you know 2030 you know overnight almost it's 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 actually had to reinvent itself and it's doing you know it's done that extraordinarily well with the help of the EPs, I, I, I should say, you know, looking at Gabe um, on my screen and, and, and acknowledging the, the really important role that the EPs have been doing um, in, in setting up the webinar series. But, you know, there's one thing that's still missing, um, you know, for a virtual organisation. And we have on the website, there's a calendar. And it was on one of your uh, screenshots. The calendar is unpopulated. And I am constantly finding that I have a clash between, sometimes I have three uh, webinar meetings that are working group meetings or ACO meetings, and they're clashing and they shouldn't clash. We have the facility, but we don't have the discipline. So that's another role, um, small tweaks. Um, that have to be done within the organization so that but people need to understand the importance of even for instance responding to the annual reporting because at the moment I think only you know the the actual fall um, return um, you know when we started reviewing the compliance of NATCOM there were something I think about 61 percent of committees national committees replied fulfilled their annual reporting obligations. And um, I think that's actually dropped off since, since we, over the last three years, it's been the ISCs, the Scientific Council that has been checking. And whilst it wasn't being checked and people weren't being reminded all the time and we weren't writing to them to say, you haven't submitted your annual report, then the compliance has fallen off again. So people aren't, you know, you know, the the actual compliance of the the it's 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 more than just compliance. We called we called the body that was actually looking at it, the review and facilitation committee, because we knew that actually for a lot of committees it was beyond their capabilities. And Compliance is like a big heavy stick. And really what we wanted was a, you know, a carrot. How can we make it easier for you? So, and we did get feedback at that time from committees saying, you know, just keep the records on file. Don't ask the same information every year, you know? And, and so there was a big triennial plan that was, uh, you know, a template that was issued to try and get all of that necessary information out in one go. But unfortunately that changes um, every time. So we realized, you know, it, it was realized that the, the, you know, the template should be as short as possible and then just focus on a couple of questions, new questions every year that relate to the theme of the organization. Um, and, you know, and always invite the committees to say what's important to them. So long answer, Ega, I'm sorry, I probably strayed away from what you wanted to know <laughs> in the first place. Okay, um, I think uh, Sheridan wanted to uh, add something. Uh, Sheridan, do you want to? Yes, look, I just say... wanted to add what, one thing that um, wasn't touched on then. The scientific committees have done a review of the principles under which they operate, which is called the Agassian principles. And arising from that, there was a recognition that since those principles were written, the working groups had really come to the fore and there was a lot more being created on a regular basis. And so at the General Assembly last year, some guidelines for how working groups might operate were published and put out for comment. 
and all the working groups have been identified, uh, invited rather, to comment on those guidelines. And I think it's really important, and I know your group has, that we encourage everyone to do that because the working groups are kind of a bit of a hybrid between the yeah. National Committees to Scientific Committees and have that transversal nature. And some of them will become scientific committees, some of them will cease to operate because their mandate will be completed, and some will continue on. And for those that continue on, the democratisation of their processes is quite important. So that, that's a conversation going on in ECOMOF right now and really important for people to be part of and to get engaged with at the present time. Yeah. And, okay. and, and there's one other thing I, I think that needs to be, you know, there needs to be a, a similar review amongst the national committees to make sure that the, the principles that govern the national committees also, because the working groups are actually um, made up of national committee members and ISCs. So we both need to make sure that we're complying. And I, I think the Dubrovnik for letter principles similarly need to be reviewed. Sorry. Um, uh, th thanks for that, uh, uh, Deidre and, and Sheridan. I think the for us, we've already given some some points, and I do hope that the, a lot more um, uh, working groups or ISCs and NCs also provide their inputs. Um, with regards to Cecily's presentation, I saw uh, Mirai had a, um, a question on the timeline for test runs. Uh, Mirai, do you want to ask your question? Hi, um, do you hear me? Yeah, you can hear yes, me. Yes, yes. Um, okay, so thank you, Cecile, for this um, presentation. I was just wondering about the timeline, but also the economic uh, viability of the idea, because I'm just thinking more and more uh, how to change the perspective that the culture is the one that uses the funds, but never is able to actually economically uh, sustain itself. And these kind of ideas, I think, opens up uh, more opportunities to achieve this objective. So I was just wondering if there was any um, idea also from the point of view of an economist. Thank you. Thank you so much for that question. Um, well, the timeline, that all depends on, on the interest this receives uh, because um, what uh, the, the idea was to, was to start this uh, small with a few interested people and see how it could uh, grow. Um, it could grow quite organically, it could take a long time or it could uh, go quickly if there are uh, many interested. As for, um, uh, as for uh, the or financial or sustainability model behind it, um, this sits within World Heritage Catalysis, uh, which uh, has a business model. So uh, the initiative, uh, I don't see this as something that will need external funding necessarily, especially not in the long run, because I I, I think it's important to develop something like this as uh, in a, its own sustainable economic model. Um, I actually wrote a, a, a response to this, but it landed in Fergus' uh, email, <laughs> so I'm just going to see here. Um, yeah, and, and actually also I've been thinking about how this could potentially be developed into, into a cooperative, which I think could be quite exciting. But this is, uh, this is early days. Um, and uh, for me, it's uh, just very exciting to share this with you. And I would very much love to uh, collaborate with you upon these questions because I'm, uh, this is developed for a network for others, not, not just for me. So this is me putting it out there. And then, uh, yeah, I'm gonna think about your question and then um, hopefully be able to give you better response next time. I think uh, Cecily, uh, uh, um, um, Deidre is also already volunteering for to be part <laughs> of it, so, so that's very good, right? Um, um, I thought that AG also had a question on the, is it possible to have non-heritage practitioners to be part of it as well? Oh, sorry, there are other people who are raising hands, but uh, is there a possibility for non-heritage practitioners to join in? Absolutely, it's for everyone. And as you saw the front page of, uh, of um, the World Heritage Catalysis, I've been thinking about this as an entry point of, for all stakeholders that have an interest or somehow related, it could even be for 
people that love visiting World Heritage Sites and somehow would like to, to join in. I mean, not all exchanges will be around uh, uh, technical aspects of the convention or, 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 or site management. It will be around human needs, uh, but, um, but uh, building and, and in involving a professional network like this is very beneficial because we are already engaging and exchanging. And so, so basically in terms of for time banks, it's, it's, it's very exciting to, to think about its potential within this context because there are many decks that could spin and if we could start to get some circulations in and um, within and um, um, among these sacral groups I think you know we can have real real value based um, yeah movement I, I uh, understood uh, I think we have two hands raised so Maybe I'll do um, have uh, James uh, say his piece first, and then Deidre uh, uh, next. Yeah. James. Uh, well, thank you both for the very interesting presentations. I think one thing that's striking me is uh, how is the interface going to work with the huge? Um, we're, we're seeing that the website, and um, you've talked about emails being incredibly uh, an efficient way of doing that, uh, with the increasing use of things like Teams and uh, other such platforms, is there a way of integrating both ideas to allow quicker exchanges? Um, uh, this platform, uh, are there any other platforms that we could use at ICOMOS to help exchange these ideas quicker uh, and maybe even facilitate a more efficient uh, way of uh, writing reports and feedback loops and so forth? It's just a just a question if anyone knows of any other. I mean, I think Teams is probably the most common one we've all been using during this lockdown. Uh, it has its limitations, particularly if you're a member of multiple organisations. You need to have seem to have a laptop for each Teams group you're in. Um, but are there any other um, ways of collaborating to share documents, reports, and so forth? I know there are a number of ones, and perhaps it could be a way for Icomos to collaborate internationally as we do here um, like with um, these meetings it's just really a question out there and I think if it's a brainstorming session it could be a nice one to how we can move forward and again maybe integrate that with this time sh this time uh, share uh, element as well um, I, um, I think uh, for that one um, there are a couple of um, and, and Deidre can correct me if I'm wrong so the the SCTF, the Sustainability and Communications Task Force, is also thinking of the institutional memory and what, how do we save uh, documents? Of all these are being um, um, asked there. The for for the SDGs working group, we actually have um, uh, like a Google document that, that uh, our communications team is now uh, crafting and uh, being um, um, having it more uh, uh, structured in a way that the uh, colleagues can can look at the particular documents, so watch out for that space. But uh, as a, as an institution, uh, definitely we have to think about that. And maybe uh, Deidre has some some thoughts. Um, oh, I thought I was muted, and I'm not, sorry. Um, well, Gabe, I was my my hand is up for other matters, but you know, um, I certainly. Do yeah, it is one of the things that we've been looking at. But the the there was a presentation that was made to um to ICMAS, to ADCOM actually um on institutional memory by Austria um I think two years ago now um and they were to be working with the uh, secretariat on um on really how this might be introduced into ICOMOS. But I do know that the, there, is, there are some big changes going on in the Secretariat at the moment, which, which have meant that their priorities are focused on things that we, you know, other than the, the Sustainable Communications Task Force terms of reference. Having said that, I, you know, I always would argue that it, you know, you can't, when things are very fundamental, you need to sort of, um, you need to act on it straight away, even, you know, to make sure, for instance, 
if, you know, every single um, working group, every single committee within, within ICOMOS has their own challenges in terms of archiving their records. ICOMOS Ireland is doing that at the moment and has, you know, has paper records, but also now we have very much more archival records, so our digital records. We, we, we do need to do this as a, as a priority. So there is some, um, a structure that Austria had promoted, but we have to review and see whether how fit it is for purpose across what committees before, you know, it's not a one shot fits all, I'm sure, but we do need to know a bit more about it. And what we have to do is we had been asked to wait until the it had gone to the board, and the board need to need had a few um, amendments, but it ultimately it got kicked down a, a bit further down the road until there was a new board. So now um, the new board is absolutely behind it, and what we're trying to do is, um, you know, it will be I it will be convened again. It has met another hiccup in that the secretariat are challenged and. Nobody wants to give more work, you know, even attending meetings is straining things at the moment. So um, we're working around it, um, but we have a big meeting. The ACOs are meeting on Monday. So maybe I, if, we had, if we had met yesterday as the original hope was, um, we would have had some more positive um, calendar, a timetable for you. But watch this space because you will be told about it in the very near future, I'm hopeful. Okay, thanks, Deidre. Uh, do you still have some questions, or? Um... Yeah, I do. I was I was wanting to ask Cecily, um, you know, about her presentation, because um, there were there were two um, slides in particular. One of them you showed an app, and you said, you know, this is WhatsApp, and you just fill in this, and this is how you register, and away you go. And I did wonder whether this was a, a notional app or whether it's actually a functional app already? That was one question. And the second part to my question was, you had a slide that you showed where you said, WETS is not this, and it was not that, not that. And then WETS could be this, and you listed uh, three things at least, um, but one of them was you referred to the rights-based uh, approaches. So I was interested to, um, you know, to have your thoughts about how, use, using a practical example, for instance, how you might apply it to that. Okay, yeah, so the first one, um, there are many technologies that could allow for the development of a time bag, but uh, since my proposal is quite wide, I've, I've been looking to Cyclos, which is uh, developed through it, uh, the, the social trade organization. Um, so yeah, that's uh, already a functional platform for time banking, which also includes an app so you can that you can download on your phone and so you can make use of as a yeah payment machine. Um, yeah, for online payment. So um, yes, but of course, I mean, it, it will take uh, some uh, some more development and also development around um, how it should be administered. Um, the rules of the game has not been set yet, and that is why it's actually. Uh, it, it's uh, I like to you know invite you to be part of of. Um, designing it um, so that, yeah, it can be useful. So to the rights-based approach as well, um, I think, uh, I don't have a, like a very clear answer to that, but uh, looking at the values of time banking, um, which is uh, about participation, the value of contribution, redefining work, etc. I think it would be interesting to, to look at how they align with the rights-based approaches, uh, which uh, from my understanding is, um, we talk about that in a very, in a, in a like a, a academic way, but maybe we could look at how time banking could be a way to, to have more of an inclusion um, and, and yeah, more human rights-based approach in our own organization.